You may know him as a multiple Grammy and Dove Award winning musician or as part of the iconic group The Imperials or for his long-standing solo career described by Billboard magazine as the single most electrifying voice in Christian music. And he is all of those things. But Russ Taff is here today to open up his personal life in a new way. He's talking publicly about the hidden trauma that was slowly destroying his life behind the scenes. Russ, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks for opening up in such an honest way. You and your wife has just recently done a documentary about your life, um, and you're really talking about some hard stuff. Yeah, I love it that we didn't know we were praying before we started the documentary, uh, any of it, before the end. They used that prayer to open the documentary, Tori praying. Um, but it has been a long journey. But growing up in a uh, you know home where dad was a Pentecostal preacher, you know that old line. Uh, you're hanging over hell by a thread and you never know quite where you're standing with him that he could let go any time and fear-based fear-based it was just fear and uh, the parents were raising me the way uh, they were raised I'm sure it's uh, you're not worth the salt that goes on your bread you're not worth the bull to shoot you with and you'll never amount to anything mm. and that was constant constant and if it's said to you often enough you start believing it and uh, and when bad things happen, you feel like you deserve it, mm -hmm. and so you let them happen. I deserve this, and, uh, and it wasn't just verbal; it was physical too. Oh, very physical. 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 Uh, I remember the worst beating I ever got in my life. I was nine years old, and I told my little friend, Mom and Dad, I had an argument. And I, uh, my older brother, overheard and told Mama, and she was waiting for me when I got home, and came over and screaming, you don't tell anybody what goes on in this family, and took off her shoes and threw them at me, you don't tell anybody what goes on in this family, and was punching me in the face with her fists, screaming, you don't tell anybody what goes on in this family. I was balled up in a fetal position in the corner with her kicking and kicking and kicking and screaming, mm. you don't tell anybody what goes on in this family. I had to wear long sleeve shirts to school for two weeks wow. for the uh, bruises to heal. So you grow up with this negative matches of who God is, but you love him with all your heart. But yeah, you don't never think... never left faith, though. That's what surprises no. me. It, the thing that was, uh, ab about it was I couldn't talk to anybody about what goes on in this family. And, um, and Mama, they call it covert incest, where you don't... It's not physical touching, but you become a spouse to the one... That's, that uh, is not the sick one, but they need someone to talk to, and so they choose you. Mm. I was 11 years old when it started, and she would come into my room, and I would have to sit up, and she would start talking about our finances. Daddy's not working. We're probably going to lose the house. He's drunk again, you know, thrown out of the church. And, and she would dump all this on me and then go to bed feeling better, and I'm 11 years old. What do you do with that? Mm -hmm. What do you do with that? So there's this, and then Dad would relapse and start drinking again, and then, you know, and he had just been in church two weeks before preaching this hard gospel, and now he's not doing it. He's doing exactly what he preached against. So there's all of these things going on inside you. So I left home and just tried to act like it didn't happen. It just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got with the Imperials, and, and, you know, the Lord has blessed me with the thing I always wanted. I wanted to be in that group, you know, and he allowed me to be in that group. Mm. But I took all of this stuff from my childhood. I took it with me into my adult life. And I was totally insecure. I was, I, I was terrified of everything. And again, you've got thousands of people telling you how wonderful you are. But if you don't believe it... Doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything at all. And uh, so I, uh, I tried to act like it didn't happen, but it wouldn't leave me alone. It would just reach up and grab me, reach up and grab me. And, and I was in... New York, Tori's brother played with the New York Philharmonic, and, and some of my Christian friends in Nashville, they drink, you know, my pastor drinks wine with his dinner, and, and that's all they, I mean, you know, then that's it, it's, uh, and so I thought, well, there's, but I never would drink because of daddy, but there was a beer, and it was hot, and I always drank Coke, and it was out, and so I had this beer, and I started feeling something, and those terrible voices that those accusing voices got silent mm. and so I had another one and I didn't hurt as bad and those voices weren't controlling every part of me and by the third one and there was only three 
um, I was okay. I was just okay. And the next day, I promise, I lifted my hands to God and I said, thank you, Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. I can live this way. This must be the way other people feel, you know, is that they're okay. And right. So alcohol was the answer at that moment. Oh, man. Yeah. It's the only thing that had worked because I'd fasted and I'd prayed and all that stuff, not knowing there was another part of this that I didn't know that he was going to show me. <laughs> but it started this, you know, career of then you start hiding, you know, and then you hate yourself more because you turned into what you hate about your dad. Now you're that way. Mm. And you'd stand up on stage and you would feel like such a hypocrite because you can't stop this addiction. And what started out as a wonderful thing now controls you and it has you by the neck and it's killing you. Mm. But you can't tell anybody what goes on in the family. Yeah. They'll throw you out. And so and you're you, at the height of your Christian music yes. career. Six Grammys, yes. 18 GMA um, Dove Awards, Christian Music Hall of Fame, like who are you gonna tell? Right, right, and you know, uh, I remember going to first, my first couple of AA meetings uh, because somebody, somebody told me how to do that. And I went, but I st sat in the back and I hid, thinking somebody's going to recognize me. And they're going to tell my friends that I'm in an AA meeting, which means I have a problem. It was a long process. And I got sober. A friend of mine, that, a therapist that I had been seeing, said, until you deal with the trauma of your childhood, you'll never be well. Mm. And, and she said, would you be willing to take off for a month? They said just a month and just go there and let them start ad addressing that trauma that you act like didn't happen, but it's killing you. And so I went and uh, I stayed there 65 days because, wow. you know, they would, I would go into these the, these therapy sessions and it was like there was this big pile of things that had built up around me and they were taking it off a piece at a time mm. and that little didn't hurt anymore and they would take that little piece at a time and they spent you know 65 days just taking this piece away and when I walked out of there I didn't hate my parents anymore I actually had empathy for them mm. and you know I had not a good relationship with my dad he was always jealous of me even as you know I began to win awards and everything else he had to be the center of attention but one thing God did for me that is the greatest miracle of all, and I was at Mark Lowry's house. We always have. Um, once a year, there's about six of us artists will get together with our spouses, and we'll eat and laugh and talk and have conversation and, and Bible study and just hang out with each other. And I got a call. Our, Mark's best friend got a call from a pastor that she went to his church, and he was in the, the hospital dying of cancer. And they asked me, his sons, that pastor of the church now, said, would you just come by the hospital? He loves that DVD Gaither did on you. And would you just come by and say hello? And, you know, Mark, me and Mark, is eat. You know, we're going to eat. You know, why don't you just call him on the phone and da-da-da. Uh, but none of us knew how important and that the Holy Spirit had set that day and time up mm. for the final healing that I was going to experience and when I opened the door and I walked in, I froze. I just froze because he looked so much like my dad. Mm. And it startled me. And my first reaction was to flight, you know. I, I don't want to be here any, anymore, uh, you know. And, but I walked in, and you know how you do when you got to require to do something. You suck it up and do it, you know. And so I walked in there, took up my acoustic. And when he saw me, he went, oh, Russ, and tears start crawling. I'm so glad you're here. And so I took out my acoustic, and I said, what do you want to hear, Pastor Jones? Do a Heartbreak Ridge that I did when I was in the vocal band. And so I'd do that. What else you want to hear? And he'd, you know, oh, say, but I'm glad. And so I sat there and serenaded him for like 45 minutes. And he started getting tired. And his wife kind of mentioned, let's, let's wrap it up. I said, after he finished, I said, would you pray for me? And I wanted to reach those words and bring them back because I was ready to leave. And he goes, oh, Russ, I'd love to. And he stands up out of that easy chair and he puts his hands on my shoulders and I'm looking up in his eyes and it was the same face of my dad. Blue eyes, you know, sandy blonde hair, black hair, gray hair and big hands and tall. 
daddy was 6'2", and he put his hands on my shoulders, and I was looking up into my dad's face, and he began to pray for me. And I collapsed to my knees. Now, he didn't know what was going on with me, but pastors, they have a sixth sense about them. And uh, he pulled my head to his belly, and he began to stroke my hair, and he said, Oh, Russ, God is so pleased with what you've done with your life. God is so happy, you know, with the gift that you're, you're using for his kingdom and you're encouraging people. And he just started affirm, affirming me. And as he did that, I cried even harder. And it went on. It seemed like it went on for 20 minutes at least with him holding my head to his belly and stroking my hair and telling me how much God loved me, how much God loved me. Mm. And then begin to heal that spirit part of me that hadn't been addressed. Yeah, my, my, my body and my mind, but that spirit had not been healed. And that day in that hospital room, wow. Jesus healed my spirit. And I left there a different man. I left there a different man. I, I walked back into Mark's house and Tori looked over at me and said, what happened? She could see something on my face. And so I began to cry and tell her and tell Mark and the other artists that were there and all of them were crying. And I said, I thought I was just going to go visit a pastor that had cancer and might be dying. But God had preordained this day for me. And he led me from step to step to step. And that day was the final healing. Mm. And... I've never been the same since. I, I stepped into my manhood. I stepped into my place as a dad and as, as a leader after that day. So tell me what's different about Rush Taft today. You received a miracle. Do you think someone watching who's done a lot of things they're ashamed of and they totally relate to you on that whole shame thing, there's not something that you've done wrong, but you're wrong. Is there hope for them to have oh, that same good miracle? good Lord, good Lord. The first thing you have to do is risk telling somebody what's going on. Just risk telling somebody. It took me forever to take that step, to trust someone, to let them know what really going on inside of me. And when I said it out loud to that person, I didn't do a whole lot of people. I did one guy. And he began to walk with me, you know, every day. And... Um, Check in on me. How you doing? You know, are you going to AA meetings? Uh, you know, are are you are, are you are you thick at church? Are you there? Are you been letting those people love you? And you know, and he monitored me for the longest time. Then God started bringing other people into my life. But it, the the whole healing started with me having the courage to find one person and to say, Hey, I'm struggling with alcohol and it's got a hold of me and I can't let it won't let go. And when I did that, and I said it out loud, and I got somebody involved with me, all of a sudden, that thing lost its power by half, mm. just by holding that secret. Because we, we hold our secrets because they're so ashamed and, and, and we're held captive our whole lives. It takes a village. I mean, it really does. It takes a village for us to get well, because you can't do it by yourself at home, begging God for help. He brings help, but he brings help through other people. Everybody has brokenness. Yes. It's just how honest we're being with ourselves and others. That's the honest truth, right. right? But you're so right. You bring it into the light and God starts healing. Mm -hmm. Russ, thank you so much for just oh, sharing from man. your heart. And I know it's encouraged so many people. Well, so appreciate you. you. Thank you very much. And if you relate to what Russ had to say, if shame has been your constant companion, if those evil, unkind words go through your mind, even no matter how many successes you have in life or how many failures. I want you to know that there is hope, that Russ is unique, but he is not alone. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. That God will work with anybody, that God will work with you. And this could be the beginning of an absolute new day in your life, the beginning of a change. If you want to have someone just pray with you, if you want to tell your story for the first time to somebody absolutely confidentially, we would love to be that person. Give us a call. That number is one 866 273 It's available day or night. We would love to talk and pray with you. We'll be right back.